Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Launch Sequence Podcast, episode 88, and for today we have some new guests on. Uh, the organization MedRunner has popped up recently and gotten quite a bit of attention. I wanted to talk to them about what they do and uh, what their plans are for the game, so thank you so much, both of you, for coming on today. How about you guys both introduce yourselves to everybody, let them know who you are, what you do, and where you come from. Yeah, hello. Um, thanks for having us. Uh, we are really excited to be here. I'm Tristan. Uh, I founded the organization back in 2020. And uh, yeah, I'm the CEO right now. I mean, <laughs> I'm actually just an org lead, but um, I'm the CEO of MedRunner. So uh, yeah, I'm leading the organization. And so, Rick here is my co-lead. Cool. And before we got started, you had mentioned that the name is pretty specific, right? It's med runner and not med runners yeah um a lot of people like to call us med runners uh i i guess because of cyberpunk you know edge runners and all that stuff um it's naturally and it's okay uh we we call our personal uh med runners ourselves it's just that the arc itself is called med runner it's a brand name we are med runner services so uh if you talk about the arc it's just med runner Okay, cool, cool. Uh, so you founded the group in 2020. Reg, did you, were you a co-founder? Did you join on a little later? How did you get involved? Uh, yeah, so I joined later. Um, I wasn't here when it first got kicked off, so to speak. Okay, okay. And you just kind of, did you guys both come together as two people who wanted to do medical gameplay? Were you uh, looking for something to build a team around? Was it gameplay specified? How did you come about? The idea of med runner i guess for for tristan well um actually med runner was obviously inspired by trauma team a lot of people compare us to trauma team and um this is also where our roots are back when cyberpunk came out um i was just really excited about the whole idea surrounding trauma team the whole concept was exciting to me i really hoped for some kind of side quest line in the game you know something that shows you how they operate uh what values they operate on and all that but yeah the game didn't really do that at all <laughs> in the end all we got yeah. was was all what already was shown to us in the demo and that's not like it's not the reason i founded the arc but it's one of the huge inspirations that um yeah led to the birth of mad runner basically we wanted to bring that kind of service into Star Citizen, and we wanted to create our, well, our very own version of that service, like our, our very, very own emergent gameplay loop uh, to offer to customers and to our players alike. And I think another big inspiration or something that really proved that services like that can exist even outside of a game through websites, through you know IT infrastructure is yeah. uh, the fuel rats, obviously um, mm -hmm. of ED. You probably know them. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, and when I looked into them and and saw how they operate, uh, how the website works, how you are able to call a fuel rat uh, from everywhere, uh, I I really thought that. Yeah, how cool that was! How how much organization was put into their uh, yeah. into their operations and and what they do. Like that, basically, they everyone knows them by now. <laughs> and um, I'm not saying that we want to recreate what they are doing. Uh, we are certainly going our own path, but um, it was another huge influence, I would say. And yeah, looking right. looking looking at what Chris Roberts uh, announced about death of a spaceman and all the mechanics involved obviously stuff changed a little bit but um yeah death of a spaceman was when i thought to myself how cool would it be to have a medical service in an mmo like star citizen uh 
it's the perfect game for it 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 it's yeah it gives you a lot of freedom to uh pursue a a, a, a job like that in a group with a bunch of people which is really cool and i i uh, sympathize with you on the idea of getting to play in some way with trauma team and cyberpunk it felt like they really took that from like the tabletop and built some excitement around it and built on the lore and then when the game came out there wasn't really too much that had to do with them yeah so if i could just chip in um mm-hmm. so field rat showed it was possible to have a player run service um others may have done so previously perhaps an eve or the like but um you know it was really dangerous to show that it's possible in this sort of game setting mm-hmm. um but of course with trauma team um in universe um through tablets and data stuff um you can see that it's supposed to matter if someone has a trauma team membership right that's a, that's that's a big deal some thug finds out the person they just knocked out has a card they know to hightail it out of there yeah. immediately um that's what we want to bring um it's an actual service that actually helps you um and it's it, it exists it's real it's not just um, a thing that you can sign up for and when you need them and you call they don't actually answer um right. having an actual practical service that's the whole deal you know so and 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 for those who may be listening to the podcast and haven't heard of the fuel rats very famous and popular group from the elite dangerous world that uh, is known for saving people out in space who are stranded because that, that's a big part. It's a big mechanic in Elite Dangerous. So just as medical gameplay is a big part of Star Citizen, um, you know, I think everybody was kind of expecting groups to start to take on these, uh, um, these roles where their reputation might precede them. And there are plenty of groups who do it. But Medrunner, I think you, you guys have done a great job of, of building that brand and showing your actions through, you know, the video you publish and, and some of the branding that you have. Um, when you say that you want to be able to always be ready to, to come and get people, how do you hope to maintain services in all time zones? Right. So right now, um, today, for the last week, for the last month, um, we've managed to have at least one team online. Um, now, of course, servers are split up. Um, only one team, you know, uh, if 10 people put in a, a call at the same time, they're not going to be able to handle it. Right. Those, are, those are hours where things aren't as busy. Typically, the, the Australian um, side of the house in every MMO is slightly depopulated. But um, the goal is to get bigger so that way you have more people who are online and able to cover those. Um, the end sort of grand scale vision is that um most not all but most um of the star systems will have one or two teams present or at least nearby in an adjacent system and able to get to you within a reasonable time um so if there's you know um not the safest star system terra probably doesn't need uh medrunner teams on standby you know not much is going to happen out there somebody's falling Um, off a ladder somewhere (laughs) <laughs> yeah um <laughs> fallen uh, during mining fall in a cave or something sure right. we do that but um more of the systems where people are um experiencing more accidents whether it's mining or pirate attack or you know whatever the case might be um that's sort of the grand vision to have one or two teams scattered across each system that way no matter where you are you can get help from somebody um that's Ob- sort of how we hope to maintain that. Obviously, right now, we only have to service one system and maybe in the near future, two. So that makes yeah. it easier yeah. for us to, to grow with the game. We view ourselves as much as an alpha as the game itself um, because a lot of what we do is very dependent on our IT infrastructure. We have an automatic dispatcher system uh, you can call in from the website. Um, right now, it's going through a Discord bot, but IT is very hard at work to bring it back to the website. Um, back in 2020, we actually started out with a really simple webhook that just put the call from the website onto the Discord. Uh, right now, we actually have databases in the background running. We have block lists 
on this database. Uh, we know what our teams are doing. We know uh, what kind of missions they are flying. We know what happened on these missions because our members are uh, putting in after action reports. Uh, everything is tracked on uh, these databases. So I can tell you that our teams right now have an 80% success rate. And um, for example, yesterday uh, on prime time, we had five teams on missions at the same time. So uh, yes, like Rex said, at all times we have at least one team active right now. Mm -hmm. But when we have prime time, when a lot of people are playing uh, the game, our players are active too. So uh, you often see four to eight teams active on our Discord server, requiring a human dispatcher to coordinate them. Um, we even are starting to deploy more SOPs for our teams regarding uh, backup procedures and all that, because we had some issues with pirates. <laughs> Not really surprising. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But That's um, why you got guns? Yeah, um, we are prepared for them. It's just that uh, sometimes a team needs to call for backup. We have dispatchers who coordinate the teams uh, who send them. You can actually see that in the in the video we uh, we posted recently. Um, yeah, um, it's just organized from the top to bottom. Like uh, we have a whole section on the website dedicated uh, to train people as a knowledge base that people can flick through and, and see uh, what we are about and learn how they are supposed to play their roles. Um, our teams of six people right now um, have dedicated medical staff, uh, security staff, uh, and dedicated pilots who all have time to train in their roles because uh, we are not a vol voluntary org. Like, there are people out there who do the same as we do, like very, mm. very um, dedicated people who uh, run similar services as we. But yeah. the reason why we want to stay a paid service and as like paid as an UEC, like we will never, um, never take any real money for what we do, obviously. This is <laughs> just a video game. But um, the reason why we take UEC fees is first, um, it is a security layer against misuse of our system. If everyone can call, you invite all sorts of pirates and griefers to set up traps. And second, um, we like the, the way Star Citizen is built, um, everything costs money, fuel, ammo, ships, you lose at some point at least. Um, so we are looking that far in the future um, that we really have to ask ourselves, how can we build this org in a way that is feasible, in a way that this service actually works when the game is out, when, when fuel costs are rising in certain systems because of activities there. When, um, yeah, we need to supply our players with the gear they need. Um, our aim is at some point in the future to be self-sufficient, actually. We want to, um, we want to provide armor, weapons, ships to our teams, so they don't have to worry about that stuff. We we don't want to send people out grinding for UEC just to fuel what we do. Uh, we want that the people who dedicate themselves to our service have actually the time to refine their skills and getting good at what they do for the service. So those not... pe those people though are, are you. Do you have open recruitment? Are you taking anybody in who yes. wants to play? Okay. Yes, we, we have a tremendous growth. Uh, we had a tremendous growth this month. Um, we are now like at 1.6 thousand members. Um, Rick, what, what number was that on the board? I can tell you in a moment. Um, yes, it is open. Um, oh, sorry. I, uh, let's see. It is open recruitment, um, and you know some individuals make fun of new people who don't know how to play the game. Um, it's a very, it's a very unique um, system that we have going, and of course, 
everybody thinks trauma team is cool and all. Um, so we get a lot of people who tell us they've never played Star Citizen and that they were on the fence of buying it, but then they saw Medrunner doing Medrunner stuff, and so they decided, I'm getting the game, because they wanted to do Medrunner stuff. They, <laughs> they don't even... Um, they don't even know how to fly. They don't know how to do anything. Um, and we're working on developing our training. You know, I can't make a tutorial for CIG, but I can at least get people um, educated on how to help others, how to talk to them and explain things to them without getting upset, right, or impatient. Yeah. Um, and get these new people who've never played this game, um, who've never PvP'd up to speed, at least able to defend themselves to a reasonable degree. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a challenge. We, we don't, we're not going to turn people away just because they don't know how to play Star Citizen. Please, you know, come enjoy the alpha gameplay for what it is. Um, you know, fall through elevators and all kinds of nonsense, but enjoy it. Fall through um, things. Yeah. Uh, Basically. So it's, it's open recruitment and we're not a hundred percent able to train everybody just yet. We're still developing. How do we want our training to look? Um, so right now it's learn by doing, and sometimes they get engaged in PVP and, you know, they get defeated and they lose a little bit of, um, um, of their morale for it, but it's, it's okay. You, you wake up back at the station again and you'll learn, you'll get better as we go. It's just alpha. None yeah. of this is permanent. It's okay. It's, it's very cool to be in a position. I mean, most, there are groups as you, uh, Acknowledge there are other groups who do this, uh, whether it's medical help, whether it's bounty hunting, whether it's transportation, touring. There are groups that are doing things in Star Citizen that Star Citizen hasn't really built the systems to do. You, you, you both are, you know, part of your group doing the same. And it's really cool in your situation, which is different than a lot of others, because you're bringing people into Star Citizen who aren't even interested in flying. So this whole subset of players starts to form in this space sim that most people think revolves around the ships, revolves around flying and combat, and then you start to get this subset of people who only want to handle freight or only want to heal people. And uh, I think that's really cool. And you could have tutorials that tell the people, you know, you don't have to fly ships. You could have someone who flies you around. I think that's pretty neat. Yeah, we actually have something of um, a deficit of pilots. Um, <laughs> they're... Yeah. Despite Star Citizen being a flight space flight sim, um, they're afraid of being the pilot because if they crash, the whole team is dead. <laughs> yeah, and they're uh, like, ah, oh, the responsibility, the danger, uh, potential PvP, and so they don't want to be a pilot. So more comfortable being on the ground. Um, so, you know, there's definitely going to be people who there already are people who do join, and they're like, I want nothing to do with flying. Do not let me fly, uh, but hand me a, a gun and I'll do all right. Mm -hmm. So. People get to carve out their own little niche um, in Star Citizen. Um, we'll see how the outpost uh, colony sort of gameplay comes about. Uh, people may find themselves on the ground more often than not. Yeah. Um, that's their chosen route. So hopefully Medrunner can be this unique experience that if you want to do it, you could jump in, go through our trainings. Uh, you're mostly training yourself, but there's a degree of hands-on. Um, and participate and enjoy it with others. You know they have been trained to the same minimum level, so you know you can rely on them to know how to use the medical gun and not be getting shot at and be like, how do I use this thing? You know, um, So everybody knows they could rely on each other. And if you enjoy it, great. Welcome to Medrunner. If you're more of a solo operative, maybe not. But we're hoping to present a career option that people could just plug into and go. Yeah. Yeah. So Sorry. No, go ahead. The the plugin aspect is is very big. Like um, we we try to minimize the micromanagement we have to do uh, through the academy system we have. Um, at some point, like we're developing that right now. But you're supposed to go into the academy section of the website, and then you you go through a quest like chain of guidelines and exams, and at the end. Uh, you're going to have a training in-game and uh, make a final exam to get your right to become a med runner and respond to real emergencies. So I think a lot of the systems we set up feel like their own game itself, like 
if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we're creating an, a gameplay loop that has the mechanics in game that we need. Like the medical stuff is obviously done by CIG in the game, but what we do with it is completely ours. And people are supposed to come into this org to train for the role they want to partake in, and then, yeah, join active teams, respond to emergencies that our system throws their way. Just with the press of a button, you're responding to someone that needs help on a planet <laughs> kilometers, like thousands of kilometers away from our staging location. Um, it's supposed to feel like a like a round of like a round of League of Legends in the end. Um, huh. We actually, we are actually um, like we have professional IT stuff like uh, uh, staff. We have people who are yeah. We have years upon years of experience in the IT industry, and they are dreaming up stuff like um, actual real matchmaking on our Discord server. So you're putting you 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 put yourself on duty. You click ready. You you choose in which region you want to be active and then the system is telling you what team you want to uh, you can join and where you have to go so right now not all of this is in place of course it's still under development but like rex said um this is just plug in and go we we want people to be able to have fun without too much micromanagement yeah, Star Citizen is definitely the kind of game that you want to try and get as much of the work out of the way for the player. And like since, like you said, Reg, CIG, you know, they can make the tutorials. I think they're working on the new player experience this year, but they've got some work to do on that. And um, it, it there's only so much you can do, really, to make it simple for people to get on board. And so I understand the the struggle to try and make it as simple and as smooth as possible. So it's a lot of work. But speaking of Star Citizen itself, I kind of want to take a step back real quick um, because we jumped straight into conversation about MedRunner. We're going to get back to that. In fact, I want to talk to you guys about upcoming features and things that you want to see that are going to help, you know, this expand. But first, I kind of want to ask, where did your story start with Star Citizen? How did you how did you find it? Um, And how did you get roped in? Do you know what a golden ticket is? I do. <laughs> I do. I know, a f- yeah. I know a few that are still at least following I've, the game. I have one in my account. I'm a t- golden ticket holder. I, I subscribed to the very first newsletter there was back in, I think, 2010 or 2011. Um, and I think what caught my attention was a report about Chris Roberts' big plans uh, done by a German magazine called GameStar. It's actually, I think it's one of the biggest gaming magazines we have here. Yeah, and they've uh, been consistently covering oh yes. Star Citizen. I also remember their report about the Derek Smart thing. Like, if you remember that, um, that guy who, who, who tried to... That went nowhere. See, yeah. see now, you, now you summoned him. He's going to end up on the podcast <laughs> yeah. somehow. Yeah, yeah, indeed. All right. So, so you've been around for a while. Uh, it was the original dream that, that brought you in. How do you feel about how much it's changed from there? I have to admit, in the first place, I wasn't that interested, actually. Um, because the original plan was um, to focus on that single-player campaign. And I don't actually have a space sim background. So I had no emotional connection to who Chris Roberts was or what he was doing with that game. I just saw that he had big plans and I wanted to see where they were going. Um, I think when the Kickstarter campaign continued and you were able to see how big of a scope they would end up with, that was when I got really interested because uh, I like MMOs, I like online games where the players have some kind of power to change the universe. Of course, Star Citizen's concept is more like the 90% NPCs, 10% player thing. <laughs> I know that this is not another EVE Online, but 
it certainly has sandbox gameplay aspects. Like a lot of emergent mm -hmm. gameplay is going to happen. This is what Chris always talks about, uh, emergent gameplay. And this is also what our org is about. So yeah. I think this is the aspect that, that, uh, that uh, yeah, I really like about Star Citizen, that you have that, that huge world. And I mean, we only have one system, but the planets are already huge. Like there are so many locations. Yeah. that look beautiful already uh, and there are gameplay opportunities even if um a lot of this stuff is still under construction uh <laughs> a lot of yeah. it yeah yeah and yeah. that's 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 fine i mean of course i i joined back in 2010 I, this is now i'm following the game over 10 years uh and yeah some some stuff um some stuff is slow. Some some development aspects are slow, and uh, but at the same time, they always, you know, they always get my attention back, because um, with the amount of love and dedication they put into your, uh, they put into their game, it's um, it, it's nice that we get regular updates. I think what kills a lot of games like this is when they kind of start to lapse in their updates and. Uh, people just generally lose interest, but Star Citizen has done a really good job, especially since 3.0, of just keeping regular updates coming. And I think that's a little funny to say after the year that was 2022, but you know, you guys get what I mean. It, yeah, they, they they weren't as regular, but like we still see an update in testing. You know, it still keeps people understanding that things are moving forward. So that's true. It's, no other game could have held my attention like this. I. It sounds like you are. The I mean, same no, no other game is doing what Star Citizen is doing. So, um, yeah, uh, <laughs> I think that's a big reason why we still follow this game. It's a crazy, the, the scope is crazy. I'm, yeah. I mean, everyone knows that. Um, if you like, if, if what we do right now, what Matt Runner is doing right now, you know, flying from a space station, loading up into a ship that is basically its own physical space, uh, flying down to a planet landing somewhere someone got downed at someone needs help on a planet you can fly to without loading screen um, i think this kind of immersion gameplay is not possible in any other game right now and it i is... don't i don't what no go ahead um and i i don't i at least i don't really know any other game that is trying to offer the same experience of, of, on the same level. Sure, there are games by now that are doing the whole planet side stuff. You know, you, you can fly from planet to planet without a loading screen. Uh, I think No Man's Sky really made that concept popular. But yeah, it is um, nothing on the level, like, like the, the, the detail level of Star Citizen. Like, it's just nothing comparable. Yeah, I was going to say Kerbal Space Program, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, Star Citizen is is very unique in that in that regard. They do a lot of things differently than others, and at a high level of detail. Um, mm -hmm. Greg, what about you? How did you come across Star Citizen? Um, not till twenty sixteen, okay. um, which you know was just a couple of years ago, right? With development, surely. Um, but I had been following it before then. Um, I, I like sci-fi. Um, I had played Eve, not terribly long, but enough to enjoy it to a point, and then that was enough of that. Um, but uh, his early trailers, um, the very first one with the Bengal and the asteroid belt, and um, they had those like uh, assets in the Bengal the ships. They look like seashells that you could buy. Um, so they had borrowed, they had purchased those assets to use in their original trailer because they didn't have ships to put back there yeah um other than the hornets so that was the first one i'd ever seen um and it was watch it today it's not <laughs> good um compared to what they're putting on now yeah so yeah, it's grown a lot i wasn't right I, I wasn't like emotionally invested in only having the single player so when they started to expand the scope um i did play around with the early hangar only um you know uh thing that they had put out i don't even know if whether they called it a demo or not um but as they're developing these technologies this planet generation and the weather systems and everything getting more and more intense 
Um, sure, we're, there's a concern about feature creep to a degree, but at the same time, they're pushing boundaries that nothing else is pushing. Other games might have bits and pieces of these aspects, but not all together and not in a seamless star system. And not, so we don't even have multiple star systems yet, but eventually multiple star systems. Um, you know, it's, it's, I, I hope it's really going to push the envelope for what is a good, let's say, MMO experience, uh, because there's a dearth of MMOs out there. They're all the same. They all have, you know, costume shops, you know, press three to do a special attack. You know, this is a, supposed to be a whole different ball game. So I, I hope this will change things up. So do I. I. I think we've already seen it have maybe not effect on the industry, but definitely an effect on the space sim genre. And as we start to see more advancements like PES, hopefully server meshing and hopefully the economy, I think people will start to take it a little more seriously. And, uh, the, the conversation will begin to shift because we're, we're all still, if you have a conversation about Star Citizen outside of Star Citizen, uh, you spend less time talking about the actual game itself and more about the feasibility money. of it. Yeah, or oh, all I was the money. Say the money. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I think, I think that kind of conversation will begin to change and people might start to recognize some of the, the cool parts of the game later on. Going back to the, uh, the cool parts of the game, I guess... The first thing actually I want to start with um, is you guys recently put out a video that, that got up a lot of attention. And I know you've done a couple of things before that, but generally it feels like even though the org was founded in 2020 and seems to have picked up speed a lot since then, things started to take a turn recently with more content coming out. Was there like an active conscious decision to start making YouTube content or uh, to promote, or was that just kind of always in the plans? So, um, promotion was always planned because we see ourselves as a service to the community, a service that, you know, we like to describe ourselves as an in-game corporation. <laughs> like I said, we are going to offer a UEC paid service in the future. And of course we need to spread the word, spread our brand establish ourselves that was always the plan but i think what really changed um our situation recently was a member of ours making a youtube video about their first experiences with our org uh, his name is snipes and you can go watch this video on youtube i think it's called um being a medic made star citizen fun yes. games. right hmm. and um it got a lot of attention and people discovered who we are, people who discovered what we do. And a lot of people apparently like what we do. They like our concept, um, how organized we are, uh, our website, uh, how we present ourselves. It's really important to us how the community perceives us. Um, that's and why we... What? I was just going to say that is important too. People don't yeah. put a lot of importance on it, but the the branding, how you present yourself, all of that yes. helps to make people feel more comfortable be becoming a part of it. And that, that is a conscious decision. Like from the get-go, we posted on Twitter. From the get-go, we, we thought about how we wanted to present our brand um, through advertisements, uh, graphical content, like, like graphic content or video content. And we put the video thing back a little bit, like in the future, into the future, because... Uh, I like to do machinima. Like I, I ever since I was fourteen, uh, I was a hobby video editor actually, and I loved producing machinima. And it's just <laughs> if you look at a lot of Star Citizen footage, you you can still see a lot of rubber banding and all that. And um, yeah, as part of our brand and how much attention to detail uh, we put into our things, we we kind of wanted to wait a little bit with like cinematic stuff uh, until the game was more stable but that video on youtube um that snipes did really like really showed us that there is potential in what we're doing let people want to see what we're doing and enjoy following our stories so that's when we decided to finally become active on youtube and yeah our first video has 
yeah, has got decent attention, I would say. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I would say I heard your name probably three times uh, in different situations within the space of a week. So it did a good job. That's a good sign, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Another, uh, sorry. Go ahead. Another, another thing I just wanted to mention is that back when, like, because we, we put that much attention to detail uh, into how we present ourselves, um, <laughs> we actually got a call from a pretty big American gaming magazine that wanted to uh, write about us even before the org really existed. <laughs> so, wow. yeah, we had to tell them that we can't do it right now. <laughs> Not yet, yeah. <laughs> Not yet, yeah, but give us we, a minute. Yeah, we, we, we still have contact. We still we still know uh, where to send that email. So at one at some point we, we might we might come back to this. It's just I think it's just a funny story because it it proves how important it is to yeah, present yourself in the right way and, and actually care about your branding and care about what you're doing and, and what you're building. Yeah. And I think Madrunner is all about that. So going t more into the game, let's talk about medical ships and what you guys like to use, what you outfit the org with. How should somebody be looking at, let's say, ship progression if they wanted to start out as a, a beginning medical help and going on from there? Reg, why don't you start, start us off? Yeah, so... I just said earlier that if somebody's never played Star Citizen, we will try to help them, right? Mm -hmm. So, by extension, ships are not required at all, um, other than the Aurora package or whatever the case might be. Um, so, the idea, the reason, we touched on it earlier, um, but one of the reasons why Medrunner is a corporation, a for-profit entity, and not a you know, volunteer uh, charity, is because ships will cost money UEC in-game. And we want to be able to provide all the equipment, including the ships, that you will need. Um, that way, some person who really wants to be a part of it doesn't feel obligated to you know, potentially break the bank to buy a Redeemer or something crazy. It's okay. We will... We'll do that in the future when we have org finances, when CIG is ready to really give us org foundational support. Um, Someday. For now, if people want to buy ships to do that, um, great. That's their money. That's their decision. Um, but they don't have to. That said, if somebody does, um, what do we use? We, we like the Redeemer. It has potential future issues um, with CIG, with um, Chris reiterating time and again that if it's not a jump seat, you can't wear armor in it. And the Redeemer doesn't really have armor storage lockers for four people. So it's not really, they've said they don't want to make it a drop ship. It has to be crew seats only. So there's a lot of potential future issues we'll run into. For now, we're using the Redeemer and the Cutlass Red in pair. That's, that seems to be the winning combination. But in the future, the hope is that CIG will give us a dropship that has armor, has firepower, uh, can carry uh, five at least armored passengers and one medical bed. T3, nothing fancy, just the lowest tier of medical bed. D don't that ask be... for a ship that can do everything, Greg. <laughs> it's not doing everything. It's, a tr it's an armed and armored transport with a medical bed and five jump seats. Done. Yeah, sounds like a, just a different That's type reasonable. of Valkyrie. Yeah, yeah the replace one of the, the Valkyrie uh, areas with a medical bed, and problem solved. It's just big. Um, a small one would be nice. <laughs> so is, is the Pisces not a regular vehicle for you guys? The we do use it because it's lots of people have it because it's nice and cheap compared okay. to you know it's, one hundred forty dollar cutlass. So yeah, it's not available in game yet though. So. That would be, I imagine you guys generally are telling people, you know, get the shipping game if you're going to use it for the, for the org stuff. Did you mean the Apollo? It's the Pisces no. is in game. The Pisces C8R, can you, you can't buy it in game though, right? Oh, that's what you mean. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not, not yet, I don't think, um, but eventually. Yeah. The Apollo, I'm sure, is one you guys are very excited for. To a degree. Um, 
Yes. It, it can have six medical beds in it. Sure. Uh, it doesn't see any passengers, really. Just the crew. And they can't wear armor in the pilot seat eventually. So, eh, it's a flying clinic. And that's how CIG has marketed it. That's as fair, a flying yeah. clinic. Um, they, they also call it a medevac. But it's a flying clinic. Pick one. Um, but that's just... So that if they one, sold us a damn drop ship, I'd buy it. <laughs> so that's, in that's that, the biggest problem right now, yeah. And in that in this instance, your problem is that there's nothing that's super armored and ready to go into combat. They're they they have these things that are ready for medical attention, but not necessarily the combat side of it. Right. Things that they have right now are really passive, I'll call it. Um the Redeemer is the opposite. Um something in the middle is what we need. Uh, and there is no middle ground. Either you're doing this or you're doing this period in the story. That's sort of purposeful for CIG. Um, but I'm just hoping in the future they'll fill in those gaps with something. It has, there's a market for it. Um, people have been asking for um, a medical terrapin for well over a year. I don't remember when that first um, individual who did like a Ooh, artwork the of the terrapin. Oh, gosh. I love that. Yeah. Yes. That was a couple of years ago. Like people have been wanting it. Yes. Give it to us already, for God's sakes. Yeah. I drop that in videos as much as I can. Like, CIG, please. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it sounds like you, you guys, I mean, obviously, you're doing a lot of this. You have a lot of thoughts on how things can improve, how things are right now. I think what we've seen in the last year was a huge testament to how much CIG listens to the community and tries to collaborate in improving gameplay with us. So we saw racing really... They, they just took what the players were doing and expanded on it. Do you guys want to also take the opportunity to make informational, instructional content that is aimed towards helping CIG understand what's going on? Or do you just want to make a place where people can be medics? Like, is that at all involved in your mission? I think both to an extent. <laughs> like, um, I think our main mission is to make this service run. Uh, the ARC only exists because we want to make this service a reality. So we are mainly a place to have fun. But like with the success we had recently and with our member count growing and we running into issues and problems on the way because well, that's how things go. Expect, especially uh, when you play an alpha, <laughs> and there's a lot yeah. of stuff that is subject to change or is outright missing or stuff that doesn't really work like it intended, it's, it, it's intended to work. For example, um, one issue we're running into right now is that when our teams respond to any kind of facility like a bunker and there's a restricted area or security personnel on site, um, the medical beacons we take don't always grant us access to that location. And then the whole team has a crime stat, which is really bad. Uh, yeah, really bad for the service because then yeah. people have to get rid of the crime stat before they can return to the master point and rearm and all that. It's it's a hassle. And um, yeah, we, we hope that re in re regarding medical gameplay that, that CIG is able to find a way to yeah, to give medical responders, emergency responders in general, um, yeah, a special, I don't want to say special treatment, but I think you understand what I mean. Like, if I go into a bunker and respond to uh, a medical beacon, I should be allowed to be there just for gameplay reasons, because otherwise the beacon doesn't really make sense. Um, Maybe they decide later on that, hey, if you if you were on an illegal mission in a bunker, maybe you shouldn't even be allowed to make a beacon. But that's not for me to decide. It's just one of the things we have to keep in mind when designing our SOPs. Uh, we right. really want to avoid crime stats, but sometimes it's just not possible uh, because of how the game is built right now. And I think to come back to your original question, um, this is the stuff we want to communicate in the developer direction. Uh, we want to show what we are building with our brand, um, the service we are running. We want to show that off. We want to make sure that they know what we are doing and that they can see 
where the game may be. I think that's is, really healthy for the game. Yeah. I think that helps a lot. It's we, we, we just yeah, we just want to show them. Like we we're, we're not in the position to make decisions or tell them what to do, but if they like what we do, we we just hope that if we run into problems and communicate them that they take a look at them and yeah. maybe maybe they come up with a solution maybe they decide that um that they want to go other direction that that's okay it's just i think we are at a point now where we should start communicating about this stuff yes it's yeah it it's it really it's not until somebody dives into the gameplay and makes it obvious to everyone else that it yeah. starts to gain some some traction in the community. I mean, we said that with racing, but we've also seen it happen with things like mining. Um, we've seen it happen with PvP. We've seen it happen um, with uh, different, like, major glitches. I don't know they don't always fix their glitches, but there are some that, like, you don't really notice, and then somebody makes a big deal out of it, and then everybody's like, okay, yeah, this needs to be fixed. Uh, and sometimes it happens. So I, I hope that same thing can happen with medical gameplay, just like we've seen it before. We hear it about the next patch that the restricted area stuff is going to be even more strict. So we just hope that we will be able to communicate that at least. I've had better experiences with it because it puts yes. the timer up on your screen and it really helps you have a better idea of like what you're able to do or not. People of our operations department, like that's the section of the org that is working on SOPs and reviewing gameplay and making plans and strategies and technical stuff, all that, all that stuff. Um, they played 3.18 and they, yeah, they were a little bit concerned about the, the strictness of the new system, mm. but um, I've, I haven't looked into these reports uh, um, to detail yet, but um, yeah, this is something we want to continue to look at, like how beacons work, how we respond to emergencies and what hinders us to do so. Like, if if there's something natural, like something like a pirate that hinders us, of course we're not going to complain about that. <laughs> that's gameplay. That's emergent gameplay. Sure. But um, if there is a mechanic that doesn't really work how it's supposed to work, um, yeah, um, I think we we are ready to do content about this. I, I'm not sure if you're going to produce videos or anything in that regard, but. You see, if you look at our social media accounts, you can see that we are very active there and very communicative. We are also doing collaborations with the community. And yeah, I think we, we are able to make our voices heard if necessary. Huh. You talk about doing the beacons, and I think you mentioned this earlier. Uh, you guys want to make it, keep it a paid service with UEC so that you're not getting trolled or griefed uh, heavily by people. But how do you handle medical beacons that are just used as bait. Do you guys run into that often? So, um, now, as you bring that up, someone in chat also asked this question. So maybe I could answer the question and yours in one swoop here. Give it a go. Um, so, of course, our alert system is in its, let's call it its alpha stage as well, right? Um, eventually, it's going to be tied into the website, so on and so forth. Um, beacons right now, currently are treated just the same as an alert. Um, we you know, encourage people to use our alert system. Um, that way they can become familiar with it and they become repeat customers. And that way our teams have something to do. There are times that they're sitting there for an hour without an alert or a beacon. So um, beacons are a risk for the client, for the individual and for us, because you don't know who's gonna show up. You're telling everybody, hey, I'm vulnerable <laughs> and I'm afraid of dying because I have stuff. Come help me. Um, that's a beacon. So, you know, you're inviting the whole server to go visit you when you're unable to fight back. So, um, we do respond to beacons and we have had ambushes. We have had people set up beacons uh, as traps. And sometimes they've been successful. Um, sometimes they've gone out of their way to assemble 20 people just to ambush us specifically. Um, and then they boast about how they've defeated Menrunner. Meanwhile, six other teams are active in other servers helping other people who actually needed help. Um, so 
it happens. We try to control it by creating our block list, uh, tracking who put in the beacon, what are the names of the individuals who participated in the ambush, uh, block them from service. And the number of ambushes we've had since we've rolled that out have significantly decreased. Now it's almost just random individuals who just feel like picking a fight. Sometimes it's a solo guy who decided he wanted to try to snag someone, and then a whole meta team shows up, finds he's not having an emergency, so we tell him to have a good day. Um, nice. That's, that's generally how we handle the beacons. Um, just the same as our alert system, but we encourage our alert system because the beacon is just waving a big giant flag saying, hey, come visit me. I have loot. Yeah. Um, um, but um, to sort of dive into the question that they had, it's not a cash grab UEC, right? Um, it's not. <laughs> it is comparable to life insurance, except with a SWAT team. Um, but the idea is that is paying for all the ships and the gear and the training and the so forth. It's meant to be self-sufficient, not just a pure profit. I expect that I might need to have a second hobby in the game that makes a little extra cash to help pay for all this anyway. But we'll see how it goes. Yeah, that'll probably be the criminal side, right? You go and cause this, <laughs> cause a trouble and then send your, no. <laughs> send your team in. No, <laughs> that's not allowed. No, no, no. Uh, no. Yeah, no, I'm sure that's very against the rules. Um, yes. Following up on that question, then, I'm very curious about what kind of services you guys offer and think you will in the future. You do a lot of this response on alerts and beacons, but have you also considered things like escorts or paid services or just contracting for events and stuff like that? Justin, do you want to answer or do you want me to answer? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll begin. <laughs> um, right now, as I said already, we are focusing on one thing only because we want to f do that thing exceptionally well, and that is medical res emergency response uh, with a punch. <laughs> like, um, obviously, like I said already, uh, trauma team was something that inspired this, and um, yeah, the, the, the combat medic response is, is something we've, we are focusing on, and there is no plan to branch into other industries in the, within the game. Like, we are not going to be uh, mercenaries you can hire. We're not going to offer uh, escort services or everything in that regard. Um, but what we're thinking about is different ways to service our customers. For example, um, there will be different tiers. Like You will be able to select the tier you want. Um, there's going to be an entry-level tier that is not expensive that every entry level player should be able to afford then we have tiers that grant you a bigger response force or tiers that are like um yeah that are more ready to take on pvp targets uh, because there are a lot of orcs out there who respond to medical beacons but um some of them actually don't do pvp and we are prepared for PvP. Like we are going to secure the client, even if there are PvP players on site, even if there are pirates on site mm -hmm. and active. So we will probably put this into a tier at some point. So um, we don't put in more money that we get. <laughs> like we can't. If someone is paying us five thousand UEC a month, that's not much. And um, we can't respond to that with a huge response force. That's just not feasible. So, yeah, yeah we have we will have tiered, uh, yeah, t tiered responses you can subscribe to. And another thing we want to branch into our enterprise plans. Um, we are thinking about distributing our bots like the the M E D Medrunner Emergency Dispatch to uh, orcs that want to hire us. And then they will be able to call for help through their Discord server without even having to join our server or going to the website. So you will also be able to get Medrunner coverage on, on groups, orcs, yeah. All so that you're stuff. currently not affiliated with any groups, but in the future you are looking to offer that kind of a thing. Yeah, we are, we, we are looking to offer... Uh, like um, our service to to bigger groups and orcs. Um, what we can't do is alliances, diplomatic stuff. That stuff is 
just not up our alley because we see ourselves as a as a neutral service. We want to service everyone. We even service people with crime stat if they are not in the middle of uh, an illegal activity. <laughs> uh, we don't really don't really discriminate there. It's just um, uh, yeah. You help you. You ever end up with a situation where you're servicing both people who shot each other? <laughs> I mean, I think once. I, I've read I think the, once. <laughs> I, I've read the trauma team comics. So <laughs> now, um, I mean, we we thought about this. Uh, of course, our teams are not going to shoot each other, uh, but um, right now we're still working on our terms of services. Uh, but I, I think the plan right now is that if you are in the middle of an illegal activity, if you're, for example, uh, trying to rob another player or if you murdered someone on the planet and call for Mad Runner because yeah the job you've done gone bad um if the team finds that out on site uh, they decline service it's it's yeah. as easy as that that's that's the line we have to draw like we we are not here yeah. to support pirate activity or illegal activity under UEE law uh, that's not what Mad Runner is supposed to be called for so we we have the yeah we have the capability to decline and we can also thanks to our block list and the it infrastructure we have the database that is running in the background we have the ability to block people and um if they try to yeah misuse our service um we can block them and then just tell them that hey you have to pay a fine to get your account unlocked again that That's way cool. yeah that way we we don't really um block them forever like a kos uh, system some eve corps have um obviously we don't kill on site that's not what we do but we need a way to at least uh hand hand out punishments for people misbehaving and this is probably what we're going to do we going yeah. to block them and then hey you can pay us that much uec and then we are going to unlock you and then you have your service back it's I, yeah. yeah i think that seems like a, a reasonable way to do it um i think uh oh, sorry no go go ahead i was just gonna say i think a way to think about it is matter is not the morality police we're a corporation right i get it i i, I see you um Let's talk quickly about some of the features that are coming up. You guys are looking at that might improve your uh, the org and what you do. So, I mean, for instance, like, uh, there's actor feature uh, status tier two, I believe, is coming up. But what are some of the other things that you guys are looking forward to that might build on the gameplay that you're already doing? I, I don't well, want to say it, really, but server meshing <laughs> <laughs> i know that's it's a big buzzword but um that's yeah originally we weren't even sure if we would be able to operate the service before server meshing because if you send an alert we have to find a way to join your server right yeah. now that's working fine because they actually you know that they put it from 50 players to 100 players. And since that change, uh, it's much easier to get into service. And this is why we can operate today. But I think when this is becoming a real MMO, like through server meshing one day, and we are seeing the first steps this year, hopefully. Um, I think that's when our service is really going to be busy because people are going to be in the same space sharing the same universe uh traveling around you, you'll see so, so much more player activity in the game so much more yeah. potential situations you can get into i mean if you look at 318 right now soft death is a big thing for us um i think with people crashing the ships and being stranded without really dying um, we will get a lot of more calls and com com like combine this with server meshing. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a busy system. Yeah, server meshing is going to do a big, big deal to, I think, improve a lot of 
game loops and just a, a lot of experiences we already have make them feel better. Just like PES kind of seems to be at 318. Yeah. Um, Reg, are, is there something that you've been looking forward to that you think will help? Um, make things more interesting. S- skipping the uh, game infrastructure shoot stuff. Um, death, uh, injuries, um, not immediately dying um, as quickly as we do today. Actually having tears of injuries. The, you know, death is supposed to matter eventually. And so people don't want to die if they could avoid it. Um, that's why having a rescue ser- service is important. Um, it could save you all your stuff, but um, having, uh, if they do the whole, you've lost your arm and now you need a cybernetic replacement arm, um, prosthesis sort of thing, um, that could be very neat. Um, we may find ourselves having to stabilize injuries in flight back to a station or something. Um, right now, medical gameplay is point med gun, shoot green laser, they are healed. Yeah. Eventually, things might get a little intense on the operating table, and that in itself um, might be a lot of fun, actually, a lot of interesting challenge. You know, um, that's what I'm sort of looking forward to personally. Yeah. I will say this in Siege of Orson yesterday. Uh, it was the first time, I know they had tweaked this about six months after they originally brought in medical gameplay, but it was the first time I was get progressively getting more and more injured throughout combat. And I think that's because Siege of Orison is one of the first times we have enough combat to get injured without wiping yeah. everyone out in a bunker. But I was getting like tier two injuries, you know, I was having trouble breathing. Like I could really feel the weight of the medical stuff going on. And it was cool to have... My friends near me, you know, they had to keep drugs coming. Uh, We had to take things slowly at times. Like, it affected the gameplay in really cool ways. So I agree with you. As that system gets more deep and you start to... Armor maybe starts to take more of a focus and protects you more and you get more injuries. It's going to be cool to see how long-term FPS missions will uh, change with that. Cool. Well, guys, I think that is about it. Um. You know what? I actually want to let me ask you one more question. I know we, we you mentioned that you only want to stick to a certain type of medical help, which is coming in, you know, guns at the ready, uh, evacuating players out and getting them to safety. But are there different roles in the org? You say there's dispatchers and there are medics. Are there more kinds of roles that people take? Yeah. Um, <laughs> when we. When we got our first uh, human dispatches going, um, I asked them, so did you guys expect to play Star Citizen like this? Um, they don't even have to fire up the game to play Star Citizen. Um, <laughs> there's More roles have popped up as we've gotten larger, and we realize we need support infrastructure. Um, logistics. Um, CIG hasn't given us the org tools yet, but our logistics people are fanatical. Yeah. And um, so they're doing what they can. Uh, enjoying that drag and drop gameplay without the transfer all stuff. Um, but uh, then we have our dispatchers. That's a whole entity in itself um, that requires training as well, um, just to just so everybody knows what they're doing and why and all that. Um, within the teams, um, sure, you have your security and your medic and your pilot, um, standard gameplay, but then you have your team lead. And um, for me personally, I want, you know, it's not going to be, terribly difficult to become a team lead, but I want our team leads to actually exercise a degree of leadership. I want to teach them a little bit on on how to coordinate a small group of people and work together. Um, and so that is, you know, almost a little more on the personal development side as opposed to just our citizen gameplay. Right. Um, otherwise, um, we have our trainers in our operations department. Operations department writes all the policy. So we have people who are writing and uh, reviewing and fine-tuning and so forth. Um, HR um, for processing recruits, but also bringing them up to speed. What is MedRunner exactly? How does it work? Um, Documenting everything um, in databases, using Excel sheets. It's it's turning into a functional entity um, in every way, except, uh, of course, it's um, all just volunteer people in their free time. A lot yeah. of them do this professionally and they enjoy doing what they're good at. And so 
oh, yeah, we, everyone's we, a professional. We actually have people who do search and rescue in real life with us. Oh, yeah. We have a lot yeah, of them, yeah. It's, it's really surprising how how many, like, I mean, in general, the Star Citizen community is a little bit older than other gaming communities, I would say. So mm -hmm. you see a lot of professionals who look for a, a special um, special kind of yeah, experience. And That's, I was going to ask about that, if you had people who were professionals who were doing this, who maybe want to see some of the stuff from their real life jobs uh, a little better represented in the game. Yes, yes, we, we have. We have um, several people who have a medical background. And we have one member in our operations department who is actually... Uh, is, uh, I don't want to say the rank because then I'm going to say the wrong one. <laughs> but he, he is part of a, a search and rescue organization in Florida. Mm. And he has the experience with training new members and... Uh, He's actually like responsible for writing some of the SOPs in their real life organization, and uh, he told me, "Hey, I really want to help with uh, your org and Star Citizen because uh, this is what I love, and I have the experience. Look at this here, and uh, can I help?" So yeah, um, we added him to the team, and. We have the same in the HR department, for example. There's, there, there are some people in HR working for us who are also HR in real life. Oh, wait. Yeah, we... Fun, a lot of fun times. And, 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 <laughs> and, <laughs> and um, obviously, IT, uh, without our IT professionals, this whole thing wouldn't be possible. Like the whole thing I talked about, the... Um, the infrastructure we have, the databases, the website backend, the... Um, customer portal we are going to build very soon um and the bot obviously that we are using for uh, automatic dispatcher services yeah that wouldn't be there without these people uh working voluntarily uh for us and pouring in their love so yeah i'm, I'm really thankful for our professionals because they bring important know-how to our org yeah that's Most... sorry go ahead Oh, my apologies. I was just going to say, most people we have uh, working in our staff have some degree of professional experience. Um, the one individual he mentioned is civilian search and rescue, but we also have military search and rescue. You have um, um, it's, uh, police, uh, firefighter as well. And so it's just a, a mishmash of people coming in in their free time. Um, not, not any one of them has ever been like, I'm the expert. We need to do it my way. All of them have been professionals. They're leaders. They know how to talk to people. They're, it's all collaborative, and they're supporting one another, and they're giving feedback to one another. It's it's actually really nice. Um, <laughs> I can't say I've ever seen that before previously. Uh, it's always people butting heads, and um, no, here it's a professional, collaborative environment. It's it's very refreshing. It is. Um, it's, it's nice and a it. huge relief. <laughs> yeah, 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 I can imagine. It's nice to get to get a group of people uh, working together like that. So uh, that's, that's actually about it. I wanted to wrap up with a little bit of talks about you and your members. And finally, before we go, um, I just want to give you guys a chance to let everybody know where they can find you guys, your org, um, how they can join, and maybe the kind of member that you're looking for. So you can, of course, always find us at at medrunner.space. That's also uh, where you can click the emergency button and send in an alert if you need help. Right now, we're only servicing the live service, so uh, please don't do PTU calls. <laughs> but yeah, we also on social media, Twitter and Instagram, mainly. me. You can find us there uh, as medrunner.sc. And yeah, in, in terms of members, um, it's not as hard to get into our org. Like, if you're a new player, you don't have any experience, that's not a problem for us. We will bring you up to speed. If you're a veteran, you know your stuff, and we, yeah, we notice that you know your stuff, you will be in an active team pretty fast. Uh, so, 
I think the main aspect we are looking for is well, like you you have to be a team player. Uh, like Rec mentioned, uh, in many gaming communities, you you got the headbutting and and all that stuff and people um, fighting over who takes point and all that. Um, we really need people who know that um, our org and the service are the most like other. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> what I want to say is. Uh, we need we need people who are yeah who want this service to succeed. People who want to support what we're doing, and who are not into this kind of stuff to to just look cool or uh, try to to yeah put the spotlight on themselves. What we want to put our spotlight on is the whole org, the whole organization, the brand, yeah. the service. Yeah, makes sense. You want to make sure people are there for the actual service itself. They yes. want to be a part of something, yeah. um, not just solo ops. So, you know, be a part of it. Um, work with others and make some friends and have fun in alpha. Um, don't get killed by an elevator. Yeah. And if you do, Medrunner will be there to help. <laughs> Thank you both for joining me today. I uh, appreciate you for coming along for episode 88 of the Launch Sequence Podcast. I'd like to thank all of our supporters who are here listening live. If you'd like to support this podcast, uh, keep it ad-free on the audio platforms. Consider checking us out on Patreon, YouTube, or even on Twitch. You guys all have access to these podcasts live. And uh, if you're watching on YouTube and you don't like YouTube ads, like I said, the audio platforms that you choose for all your podcasts don't have any ads, so check us out there as well. But uh one last thank you to everybody who's listening, and a thanks to you, Tristan and Regnion. Appreciate you both joining me today, and I will see you, everybody, next week. Mm -hmm.